Un demi heure. Ah. Un milieu. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think it's just, there's a bit of echo going on here, huh? Are we, is this normal? Probably not. <laughs> Need to stay as far away from the, as far away from the speakers as we can to avoid the echo. Yeah. All right. Wow. Okay, that's echoey. Anyway. Um, uh, okay. Cool. All right. That's very echoey. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Is, is this going to be this way during the whole talk? Yeah. Uh, okay, I don't know. <laughs> can try that. Just try to turn off yours. Testing, testing. Yeah, that's, well, and there's nothing. So. so. Testing. Nope, there's no mic now, I think. No. Yeah. Hello. No, that's nothing. <laughs> oh, does it any bit? Yeah, I heard the mic. Okay, okay, cool. Okay, so that's. Yeah, uh, yay. Um, we still have a f minute to go, I think. Go. Cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just have to see if we need to like, turn off, turn back on or what, or if they yeah. just fixed it. Uh, we'll see. I, th I can just. Uh, is yours on or is, is it off? It's on. No. Okay. okay, I think they fixed it. Cool. Uh, should I stand behind? All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Stefan Graeber, work at Canonical uh, on the LexD project. And I've got Christian Branner, who's these days at uh, Microsoft, working on Linux security, kernel type stuff, mostly, I think. Um, and we're going to be talking about SecComp, system co interception, and how that can be useful for containers. So, uh, for anyone who came to our talks before, especially at the Security Summit, this is going to sound slightly familiar, sorry, um, containers and different types of containers. So you've got your privileged containers, you've got your unprivileged containers. One is bad, one is okay. Guess which is which. Um, <laughs> privileged containers are unfortunately what everyone uses, which is slightly unfortunate. Um, you know, your Docker, Kubernetes, and all of those have the annoying tendency of using privileged containers. Uh, something like LexD defaults to unprivileged containers, which makes use of the uh, user namespace as the primary barrier for, for security. Whereas privileged containers, uh, it's kind of you know playing whack-a-mole, trying to plug all the holes and trying to, to run as many like LSMs and second profiles and whatever to try and prevent someone from just gaining root on your entire system. So obviously we want to go more towards everyone should be using unprivileged containers. Privileged containers should not be a thing. But there are a bunch of things that don't quite work inside of unprivileged containers. Um, they're effectively running as a random user on your system, and we don't allow random users on our systems to do a lot of things. But there are ways to kind of fix that. In some cases, the, the way to fix it is uh, we had new namespaces, we had some knobs, and then root can tweak some of the knobs and allow unprivileged users to do privileged things to an extent. Um, that's fine, but we're not going to have 50,000 different namespaces, and there's been some, some issues with getting some specific new ones in the past, so that's always a bit tricky. So, um, that's, that's kind of, that was the state of things before we started really looking into SecComp and what we can do with things like system for interception as a way to, to give more privileges, but in a way that's quite controlled and mediated 
by um, processes on the host to otherwise unprivileged containers. Um, question. Right. Um, so SecComp and system call interception. I mean, uh, most people here are familiar with SecComp, I assume, more or less. Um, and uh, one of the convenience, uh, convenient things is that SecComp um, sits in the system call entry path, uh, and it's actually uh, it's actually done before you perform any system call. And uh, so you're fairly early on. Uh, you have your second. Uh, you you can run your second program. And uh, one of the problems that we traditionally had, for example, is if you have certain system calls, and some of those system calls we will mention later, um, is make not, for example. And uh, we want to be able to sometimes create device nodes in a container because if you if you set up a standard container, what you usually do is you make dev null, dev zero, uh, dev tty, dev console, and so on available to the container. These are usually pretty boring device nodes, um, but the kernel just flat out allows the creation of device nodes in unprivileged containers. So the kernel will require that you are capable within the initial user namespace, so on the host, and you will have to have Capsys admin uh, in order to uh, create device nodes. And uh, the reason for this is simply that if you could otherwise create stuff like def, I don't know, kmem, defmem, whatever, some random block device, and then crash the kernel um, trivially. But think about dev null and dev zero, or dev random and dev u random, uh, which are required to even run containers. The way we do it in unprivileged containers usually is we bind mount the devices from the host into the container. Um, but there is actually no really good reason why we shouldn't be able to just create this device node in the container. Um, you could have probably an allow list in the kernel and say here is a set of device nodes that's okay to create, but it's kind of hacky and it doesn't feel right. So for a long time we weren't open to this, but as we found out uh, some time ago, Actually, uh, we kind of do something like this because uh, nowadays we allow the creation of so-called whiteouts, uh, which is used by OverlayFS to indicate that a file, for example, has been deleted. And it's a device node which has major and minor number zero, zero. So I don't know if uh, it's still such a good argument to say we shouldn't have allow lists for uh, device nodes in the kernel. But we currently at least don't have. And uh, we once tried to make it so that you could create device nodes, but you couldn't open them. That broke all of user space and all container workloads because the standard assumption is if you can create a device node, then you should also be able to, uh, well, container runtimes try to create a device node, and if they fail to create a device node, then they will assume, okay, I'm apparently uh, in an unprivileged container, and therefore I'm now going falling back to bind mounting the device node in. Um, and uh, if it succeeds, then uh, the container manager will often assume that it's fine to interact with this device node and uh, that you can open it. And this assumption is nowadays well spread across every container runtime user space. So uh, just making the make not system call in the kernel succeed and then uh, denying the open is not a great idea. Um, so we thought about, okay, this is just one specific instance where we're dealing with something uh, that, seems face, uh, that seems safe. And uh, we would like to be able to delegate this ability to an unprivileged container. And this is where SecCom system call interception sort of came first into place, an idea thrown around, I think, back in uh, the Linux Plumbers conference in 2017 or maybe before that. And uh, the idea is, well, so, so kind of now, if you load a second filter and you say, um, deny make not system calls for all, for a specific block device, you can filter on arguments with second, right? You can say, um, if this device number is such and such and such, fail the make not system call, otherwise uh, allow. So the idea, is basically there that you can already, you could think about a, a mechanism to outsource the decision to another process. And it was the whole starting point for the second system call interception. So instead of having a, a static policy that you load into the kernel and then the kernel denies or allows based on this uh, static policy, 
you would implement the mechanism such that another process in user space, for example, can get notified about a specific system call being performed. And then you could somehow envision a mechanism where this user space process then tells the kernel what to do in some vague sense for now. And system call interception is uh, exactly that. You have a filter uh, that you load a, spe a specific new type um, that you uh, load into the kernel. Uh, second red user notif, I think. That's it. And uh, what you get after you've loaded that filter is a file descriptor for the second filter. Well, I guess the second filter stack, I guess, is technically correct. And um, this file descriptor uh, is pollable. So you can hand it off to, for example, a container manager. And the container manager can stuff it into an event loop. And then when a system call is performed, for example, the filter tells you, notify me about make not system calls. Then the user space process will get a notification, hey, somebody just made a um, make not system call. And uh, then we have a bunch of ioctals. And uh, one of the ioctals is you can read the information about the system call that has been performed by the process at task, I should say, the thread uh, in question. And it will contain the second system call arguments um, and, uh, yeah, the regular second information that you usually get. And uh, then you can inspect the structure, um, see, for example, what make not system call has been performed. Um, and then decide whether or not you want to allow or deny the system call uh, for the container. Um, what you would usually do is you would, in user space, then enable the container manager who just had been notified about, this pro uh, about the system call being performed um, to emulate the system call in user space. Um, we, you can tell the kernel, basically we can't uh, the kernel is not in the picture of actually what to do after it has been notified. The kernel, you can, you can just tell the kernel, um, continue the system call. We will get to this in a second. Continue the system call, deny the system call, report uh, an error code to user space, a specific one, or report success. Um, but nothing more happens. Anything that you want to do, you will need to do, do in user space. So the kernel only gives you a notification. A system call has been performed. You can inspect the system call arguments. A privilege process in user space can then go on. I'm now going to decide what to do with the system call. And then, for example, say, oh, this is a make not system call. I'm now going to emulate it uh, in user space because I can vouch that this is uh, safe to do. And then after I have done, finished emulating the system call and created a device node for the container, made it available to the container, then I'm going to tell the kernel, okay, continue. Or if I fail to emulate it, tell the kernel, report back an error code. But uh, safety concerns. Um, to uh, make this a little bit more uh, engaging, can you think of a specific safety issue like any any uh, thing where it really becomes a problem? Yeah. Is there a race condition where the process could change the data after you check it? The yeah. Question, the question, or the, the answer was: Is there a risk condition where uh, a process could change the data after you after yes. you checked it? Say with pointers. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I, for example, just spoke about the make not system call, which more or less is a pretty boring system call because it only has integer arguments. So, which means the information that you get back from the kernel in the struct second data, I think it is, um, you can just directly read this and nothing will happen to this, right? But uh, say you have a pointer argument, second in the traditional BPF implementation would be different if second would be an eBPF. Um, you can't really, uh, it can't really chase pointers. So what you will need to do is you will need to open slash proc slash pid slash mem and uh, then use the offsets, uh, use the specific arguments in the second data struct as offsets into this memory and then read out the process memory, then inspect this memory and then perform the system call. So the problem here obviously is um, we have a mechanism in SECOMP where we can um, continue the system call 
uh, with the second notifier, meaning uh, you could, for example, and people immediately uh, jump to this conclusion, um, you could have the idea, I'm going to write a user space um, safety mechanism based on the second notifier for the open system call. So I could, for example, then read the path argument, path argument that is passed to the open system call, right? And then uh, read it out and then look at the path and say, oh yeah, this, this path is fine. I can guarantee that you know, nothing will happen. And then continue the open system call. The problem is, in the meantime, sometimes someone could have rewritten the path that you just parsed out and read and inspected and, uh, I don't know, wrote Etsy shadow in there, and then you're like, yeah, you should totally continue this system call. <laughs> so you have a problem. Uh, that's for example. So talk tos are actually a, a, big issue, a, a big issue. I mean, if you are very careful, then you can program around this. And, uh, but as soon as you bring continuation of system calls into play, you have, uh, you have serious issues. The way... Uh, for unprivileged container, this is often um, uh, not a problem. Like, think for example about the make not system call. The kernel is the ultimate security boundary. The kernel will disallow any make not system call anyway, so it will never succeed. So if you continue a system call, and even if somebody has rewritten it to something completely unsafe, the kernel will still deny the uh, make not system call anyway. It's similar for a few others, for example, mounting block device, file system, and so on. So really continuation of system calls in the face of talk tos like the ones that we talked about um, actually only works if you can guarantee that the kernel, your ultimate security boundary, will do the right thing even if you know, the memory is uh, rewritten. Otherwise you cannot do this. So um, it specifically means you cannot use the second notifier and I've written a long comment in the second header about this. Um, you cannot use the second notifier to implement security policy in user space for, for example, privileged uh, containers. Because people are really excited about this, right? When this landed, it's like, oh yeah, we can write security policies for this in user space. Um, yeah, so uh, still uh, another thing to keep in mind is um, second system call interception will often require that you have a trusted privilege process on the host. It's, it's pretty uninteresting if, for example, you have nested containers, you have two unprivileged containers, and in the outer unprivileged container, you have the daemon running, who is supervising these system calls of the unprivileged nested containers, be, because you, know, you can't create device nodes, you can't mount file systems, so it, it's not really any help. You always need to have a privileged process on the host for uh, interesting work that you want to do that supervises the system calls of a bunch of unprivileged containers. All right, so I'm um, going to be going through a bunch of the different system calls we, we've been looking at and implementing so far and kind of why we've, we've, why we've had to do that. Um, it's funny because the list we've, we ended up with is quite different from the list I had initially uh, back in Los Angeles or whenever I came up with the crazy idea of how about we intercept system calls and do stuff in user space. Um, like some of them we, kind of, we, we knew from the beginning we were going to need. Uh, some of those kind of just showed up as we ran into issues with specific workloads and were like, well, if we just do that, that one system code, we can unblock things. So um, the current list we do is uh, make node, as mentioned, set exada, ebpf, uh, set, uh, set scheduler, mount, and sysinfo. Uh, so that's what's implemented in NextD right now. I know that other projects have been using the, uh, the system call interception to some extent for other things here and there. Um, not sure what everyone has been using it for, but that's what, what we've done so far on our side. So the, the first one would be make node, make node art. Um, Christian kind of already went over the, the part about creating safe device nodes. So effectively, you know, you have your dev null, um, dev zero, dev random, those kind of things. So that's one thing uh, that we wanted to allow that makes it easier. For example, we couldn't run something like the bootstrap or another similar tool instead of an previous container before, because as soon as it would need to create device nodes, it was failing. Now this works, which is nice. We can build images for like a whole bunch of different distros without having to run in a privileged environment, which is really convenient. But the other thing that, uh, that really caused us to look into make node was actually over AFS. Um, because it was, uh, so now, as, as mentioned, the whiteout is just uh, C00, which works. It's allowed everywhere, but it didn't used to be. Um, it, it used to be C00, but it was not allowed for one. 
So we actually had to put uh, Cisco interception in place so that overlay, so that actually running Docker inside of an unprivileged container would be able to unpack um, its, um, its layers uh, in the overlay FS format and be able to create the whiteouts properly. We generally consider our interception of make node to be, to be safe, as in there's no obvious way to completely DOS the host or anything. Um, we're not aware of any bug in that particular code on our side. It's been working pretty well. We don't, enable, we don't enable any of those by default, but that's one that we can tell people like, yeah, you can turn this one on, and even if it's random user has access to that container, you're probably gonna be fine. The next one we've done is uh, setX adder, and that's for the same reason, in this case, overlay FS. Because another way to mark, um, I think it was also white art or something else, that was to use an, an X adder. And there were kind of two ways to do it. One would be you mount early FS and you actually delete a file or something and that will cause, um, I think it was change of type or something and that was using an X adder. Anyway, um, you could do some, uh, some actions through overlay FS and trigger it, which is fine. But as it turns out, Docker doesn't do that. What it does is that actually unpacks its layers directly to disk without actually using OVLFS, and it sets the, uh, the um, external attributes directly. So we needed to also do interception there, and we effectively have a allow list on our side for the few exadders that are safe. We obviously don't want to allow all of them because you know, having access to, say, security or any of those would be extremely bad. Um, but we are allowing um, whatever is needed effectively for, for Docker in this case. So the, the goal had always been uh, why we originally um, did these workarounds. Um, we wanted to be able to unpack a whole root file system inside of a unprivileged container, inside of a user namespace. This was something that we'd like to do fairly early on because you, you don't want to unpack a root file, unpack a root file system, and then um, especially if it's not uh, if it has exactly the UIDs and GIDs that you would expect, starting from UID zero, and then you have all of the X adders that might be on files like security dot capability um, or trusted X adders or um, set ID and uh, set UID and set GID bits and so on, um, and then have this unpacked directly on the host. It should be done in an unprivileged container in a user namespace, so all of these privileges are ideally um, isolated from uh, from the host. And uh, we, we got fairly f uh, far along. The only things that didn't work uh, were extended attributes. Uh, we did that work uh, some while ago that you can set, you can, it's basically a way to namespace uh, um, extended attributes. And um, the only thing was whiteout, uh, whiteout creation and some spe specific statics adders that we needed to be able to set. And on newer kernels, I think none of this should be needed anymore. This is uh, basically just for kernels where this isn't uh, available. And next one is the mount system call. Oh, that yeah. A fun one. So uh, another security concern that I didn't talk about um, is for MakeNode, it's fairly easy, right? You just want to create a device node for a container. Usually what this involves is you attach to the mount namespace uh, of the container and then you create this device node uh, inside of the container's mount namespace. Um, so you, you don't actually need to play any specific games with the privilege level or security level of uh, the process that is attaching to, um, uh, to the container. But uh, now when you talk about uh, system calls like mount system calls, now suddenly you have all kinds of privilege, uh, privilege, privilege levels in the mix. So you have capabilities that you require or that you might not require. You might have uh, LSM profiles. You might have um, uh, ad additional file system UIDs that you need to set, um, in general change UIDs and GIDs. You might need to attach to specific namespaces such as amount namespace, user namespace, or the pit namespace, depending on what you need to do. So one additional security uh, con concern that you need to keep in mind is you need to find the exact balance um, of the privileges that you need to retain that you had on the host and assuming the privilege level of the target process inside of the container for which you emulate the system call, right? That because you, you're basically you emulating system call for another process, so you need to assume uh, his personality, their personality uh, to some extent. 
um, while also retaining the necessarily privileges to um, perform the operation. An amount system call is, uh, for example, a prime example, uh, is a good example for this. Uh, you need to attach to the mount namespace. Sometimes you also need to attach to the user namespace if you, for example, mount a fuse file system. And that becomes really tricky to get, uh, to get right. So this is really um, low-level user space programming that gets in touch with a lot of um, kernel privilege mechanisms, and uh, that's difficult to get right. Um, so uh, this is all a nice mechanism, but these are always things that you uh, need to keep in mind. So uh, why intercept a mount system call? Well, um, oftentimes you will have dedicated, oftentimes, um, you might have dedicated file systems uh, to the container that have been originally provided by the host such a de dedicated X4 file system or XFS file system uh, for which the host or the container manager can vouch this is safe to mount. Because you cannot let a uh, container mount arbitrary file systems because you could have a malicious file system image. So usually mounting block-based file system at least, uh, so anything that is not uh, a tempfs more or less, or sysfs or procfs, um, requires privileges uh, on the host. But as I said, in some scenarios, there is a well-known path, for example, on the host there, or disk uh, that you can mount inside of the container. You could tell the container manager uh, via the system, uh, uh, SecComp system call interception mechanism, um, get noti gets notified about the mount system call. It inspects the arguments of the mount system call and then it will perform the mount uh, for the process inside of the container. And there you also uh, can uh, see the original problem that uh, was it who also correctly pointed this out earlier. Um, the mount system call is full of pointer arguments. I mean, there's basically just a flags argument, and the flags argument aren't uh, really that interesting. It, the additional problem is the mount system call is a terrible multiplexer. Um, so it can mount, it can create bind mounts, it can create specific, uh, it can mount file systems, it can mount pseudo file systems, it can change mount attributes for a super block or for a, for a specific mount. So there is all kinds of uh, layers that you need to be um, that you need to be aware of here. Um, LexD, for example, implements a way where you can say I'm um, allow listing specific file systems. So you could say uh, make it possible to mount X4 or XFS file systems. That's in general not a great idea because it means that you can mount arbitrary file systems from inside of the container. And uh, as people might know, it's possible to create an imp image as an unprivileged user and create a file system uh, superblock on it, and then, for example, corrupt the superblock in some tricky way if you have read the kernel source, co source code and you have figured out there is some bug in the X4 file system, then system call interception, like D or, or some other manager, uh, container manager would diligently mount that file system for you, and here we have an exploit. Um, uh, but uh, if, as I said, if you know what you're doing, if you can vouch for the safety of the file system that you're about to mount, then intercepting the mount system call is actually um, really nice because we, I have ideas on how to do what I call delegated mounting actually in the VFS itself. Um, but until we have that, this is actually something that we might be able to do. All right. Yeah, and, and we'll show it, I'll show it a bit later on for this one, but LexD also lets you do pretty interesting things, uh, like automatically setting up a, a ID shifting layer on top of an intercepted mount. But the coolest thing we've got is actually intercepting mount and then not mounting the actual file system, but calling it the fuse equivalent, uh, which then actually makes it pretty safe because you're not actually hitting the file system in the kernel. It's just being redirected straight to user space inside of the container. All right. And uh, this one we can go over quickly. We have, um, we have I've, I've implemented a um, POC for a BPF system call interception um, um, some time ago. And this leverages quite a few work that we did over the years in the kernel. Um, because something that we haven't talked about so far is um, I mentioned about intercepting the open system call for another process. Well, the problem obviously is that you need to share the file descriptor cable with the process in question. 
um, in order to do this because uh, otherwise the file descriptor won't be valid in the target process. So um, a while ago I did work uh, which is called PIDFD, which introduces uh, file descriptors for processes in Linux. And uh, we have a system call called PIDFD Open. And we also implemented a system call called PIDFD, PIDFD GetFD. And what it allows you to do is to get a file descriptor from uh, for a file uh, in another process. So which means you have also made it possible to intercept, accept, connect, open, and all that stuff, and BPF as well, because you have, uh, you call a BPF system call, you get a file descriptor back, um, you get the file descriptor out in the container manager, you set off all of the options that you want, you attach the, um, uh, you give the file descriptor back uh, to the, um, to the process that you intercepted it because we also made it possible to inject file descriptors into another task um, safely. And uh, then when the process calls BPF attach, will, will not, which will not work in unprivileged containers completely, um, we intercept this system call uh, as well, attach the program to the container and send the file descriptor to the target process inside of the container. And one of the limited, uh, limited uh, programs where we allowed it this to do is the BPS, uh, BPF device C group. Uh, program so that you a container uh, can further restrict devices that it has access to uh, access to all right um, the other one we, we did very quickly is uh, sketch set scheduler we don't consider that one to be safe because um, I yeah. find it dodgy yeah it, it is pretty it is a pretty, do pretty dodgy Cisco but as it turns out Android uses that a bunch for some reason and so when running Android inside of uh, unprivileged containers, we had the issues with Android being a bit unhappy about things. So we've added that option, which um, our users can opt into for specific containers where it's, where it's needed. It um, effectively allows changing like, some of the scheduling types and that kind of stuff. Uh, that in theory, the worst that we could get is that you end up with processes that have an extremely high priority. But some of the alternative scheduling options and stuff are not super well tested in Linux, not considered to be extremely safe. So there's potential issues with this one. The, um, the last one we've done recently is uh, sysinfo. And that's effectively, we've, for LexD, we've had that thing called LexCFS for a while, which lets us look at the C group limits and expose that inside the container on things like meminfo, CPU info, those kind of things to show the actual limits you have instead of the, the host-wide resources. That works pretty well, except that a bunch of processes these days are using sysinfo to get that same data. And sysinfo is a syscall, so LexCFS can't do anything because it's not, it's not a file. Um, so we recently started intercepting sysinfo as well, and we effectively fill the sysinfo struct ourselves with the data coming from, from C groups. So that way you get the uptime of the container is correct, the memory, okay, the amount of memory available and stuff is all correct as well. All right, and let's get into a bit of a demo. So, this one, all right. and my demo notes, there we go. Cool, so um, I'm just on my laptop here, I've got a container called SecComp that's running. It currently has nothing special configured on it. So I can get a shell inside it and say we try to create um, DevNull. Uh, if I put the name, it's going to be zero error right now. It's null C. Yeah. OK, operation not permitted in order to do it out of the box. Now we can change that with security, syscall, intercept, make no true. Then bounce the containers because we need to actually rewrite the second policy when it happens. We need to actually restart it. Then go inside it, make node works. Um, just to make sure that bad make node still doesn't work, so let's try to create a block device. This still doesn't work. And if we look on, on disk, we've got dev null here created properly. So that's the basic interception for, for make node we have. Now for something that's a lot more interesting, actually let me just get back in the, in the container. I do have a block device that's passed by the container manager at DevSDA. Um, let's create a file system on it. It's already one, but it's just like recreated. There we go. So just making that um, X4. There we go. And I'll try to mount this thing. 
well, that's not gonna work because you're in a previous container. So can, kernel says no, no big surprises there. And you also created the image inside of the container. You're right, exactly. So it's actually the kind of worst case scenario where the container also literally created a file system. So that's, that would be a very bad one in theory. But say, for some reason, you really trust that container and you still want to allow it. Uh, mount true and uh, security syscalls intercept mount allowed ext4. Okay, again, I need to bounce it for the second policy to update. If we go back in there, mount works. Um, but if we look at the permissions in there, they're all they're a bit wonky, and that's because mount was done by real root, but this is inside of a user namespace, so everything is shifted, and so something that should be root root ends up being nobody no, nobody no group because it's all the overflow UID and you can't actually do anything on this file system. So it's not very convenient. Um, to address that, we've got another option. So this one is shift true, uh, I believe, uh, oh, mounts.shift, sorry. There we go. Um, the policy is already in place, it's just a small tweak, so it's not, you don't actually need to change anything to mount it for that. Do the mount again, and look at that. It's all nice now. Um, so what it did is, in this case, it actually set up the, the VFS ID map shifting stuff on top of it, um, so that the permissions now look all correct. But again, this is not a very good case because the user was literally allowed to create the file system. They could write whatever the hell they wanted on the SDA, and then mount it and attack the kernel and yay, you're root, like real root. Uh, or you just crash the system, which is not great either way. Um, so that's where we've got a bit of magic. Uh, I did install Fuse2FS inside that container before, which is a Fuse file system um, for ext2, 3, and 4. And now let's go and clear some config. So I'm gonna be undoing the, the config for the shift. I'm gonna be undoing the config for the allowed file system. So that means I just have the mount interception enabled with nothing currently configured. And then I'm gonna add this one, which is fuse equals ext4 equals fuse2fs, which now means if, the, if we intercept and we see ext4, we're gonna call fuse2fs to handle it instead. So go in there and just try mounting it again. Okay, I worked. Permissions all look good, everything is fine. But now if we look at proc mounts and you look at what the file system is, yeah, this changed a bit. So now it's Fuse handling it. And this one we actually consider to be generally safe to actually enable for, for mostly interested users because it's running a process as themselves inside their own container. It's exactly the same thing as if they ran Fuse directly but it works on all their processes, even those that have no idea that they should be calling Fuse. Um, something that just normally calls the mount syscall will just work. Uh, so that one is pretty, pretty nice. The other thing I was gonna show you is the sysinfo bit. So I'm gonna set a limit on the instance. Um, limit memory, I'm gonna set that to 256 megs. Go inside the instance, look at the free output, so that's 256. That's great. That works because of um, LexiFS doing the, uh, the file overlay. So we look at proc mounts, we see that meminfo is overlaid by LexiFS already. That's why this works with free. But if we run, I've got a small binary that just does the sysinfo syscall. Uh, we can see here, if you look at total memory, it's 16 gigs. So it, see, it sees my entire laptop and not just the container. That's not very good. Um, the load info is probably also wrong, the uptime is also wrong, it all shows the host info, which is not amazing. Especially because we already have all of that data instead of LexiFS, like if I run uptime, I'm getting three minutes because that's how long the container has been running. Like we've got that data already. We had a lot of uh, bugs that users reported, for example, when they had um, specific programs, I think in this case it was Java, that allocates a chunk, pre-allocates a chunk of memory based on the system run. If Java looks at procmem info, then it would probably be fine. If it uses sysinfo, then it will think, oh, 16 gigabyte, I'm gonna use four gigabyte. And we, we saw some other issues like um, Alpine Linux, their implementation of free, I'm not sure what version of the, the standard utils they're using, but their version of free uses sysinfo, it doesn't use procmem info. 
So suddenly we had everyone using Alpine be like, hey, the limits are not working. It's like, no, the limits are working. You just don't see them. And you're going to be hitting them and going to be very unhappy at that point. Um, so now we've got the interception for this info. So just put that in place. Again, need to restart to update the second profile. And if we go back in, so meme info should still be fine. And now if I look at this info, we're going to see total RAM is effectively 256 megs. And uptime and the, the load and everything are also correct, no longer show the entire system. So that's, that's most of the useful thing I wanted to show. Uh, like there's not too much point in showing the, set, the sketch set scheduler because the only way I can test it is with like five lines of C to show that the system code doesn't fail, but it's kind of hard to show it doing anything useful. Uh, same thing with the exciter, like I could show that I can set it, but it's not super useful. So um, I'll switch back to slides. And so what's next? What are we doing next with, with this stuff? <laughs> I think uh, one of the, uh, I don't know if you want to in user space uh, intercept uh, specific system calls. I think um, in general um, for SECOMP at some point I'd like to bring up the possibility to at least in some limited way port it to uh, eBPF to uh, extend its abilities. Like we have a problem right now, which we can't, but there are ideas of um, how to solve this in various ways. Um, all of them I find to be quite distasteful um, and that's we have switched away from having a system call design limited by SECOM. So what, what do I mean by that? For a long time if you wanted to add a system call and you passed in a struct somebody would come yelling at you and tell you go away, uh, the, we, we can't do this uh, because then the system call will never be usable because SECOM can't chase pointers. So. Don't do it. Um, we finally got rid of this requirement um, because it's just it's it's uh, just not feasible and not not even to support uh, multiplexers. Um, so, for example, um, IO Uring would be a good example of a recent multiplexer. Um, uh, but also for uh, system calls um, with, for example, the new um, mount API. So we have the mount set adder system call which takes a struct argument uh, because it has a bunch of additional um, arguments that wouldn't fit in a six system call argument limit that we usually adhere to. We have the clone three system call which takes a struct argument. We have open at two which also takes a struct argument. Um, and in general that has been, that has proven to be quite useful. Um, simply because we get around all of these extensibility issues. Like these new system calls have been designed with extensibility uh, uh, in mind, uh, such that you can extend the struct and every time the struct changes, it's correctly padded and so on. Uh, it's backwards and forwards compatible. So you can actually do extensions to existing, existing uh, system calls without uh, always introducing a new system call. It's always a trade-off. You could also make an argument, we should always have a new system call for this, but then you end up in a situation where you have dupe, dupe two, dupe three, except two, except four. It's not even the versioning for that is clear. Um, so I think in general this is a step in the right direction, but obviously now we have a problem, we've seen it with uh, GLibc, um, for example, that tried to switch to the clone 3 system call because it has a bunch of, uh, it has overall I think has a nicer API. Um, which user space can use, and they would like to switch to it. But um, as soon as you run uh, glibc inside of a container and the container has a second system call filter, then in general they will block, they will often block or may block the clone three system call outright because they cannot filter. Um, if you have a use case where you say, I don't want my containers to be able to create additional containers, so I don't want uh, to be able to pass any clone flags. Uh, like clone new user or clone new pit namespace or whatever, um, then you can filter on the traditional old clone system call because it has a flags argument which is filterable by uh, SECOMP. If you do it for the clone three system call, the flags argument uh, is a U64 which is within a struct which SECOMP cannot see and cannot filter on. So the only way to prevent it from, uh, prevent your container from doing additional containers is by blocking the clone three system call outright. So if glibc wants to use clone three, they actually can't in a lot of interesting cases. Additionally, there is a problem 
um, standardizing, uh, standardizing system call interception in general in user space. So uh, usually what we recommend is if you want to communicate transparently to one of your workloads that a given system call is not available, then your second uh, filter should specify enosys. So that, for example, glibc would get enosys when it tries to perform the clone three system call and then glibc would be like, oh, okay, I see. Clone three is not available, fine. I'm falling back to clone. If your filter reports EPERM, then glibc will be what? I don't understand, and fail. So that's a, uh, that's a big issue and uh, a lot of the, I think container uh, runtimes have now slowly tried to switch this, but um, the issue really is um, that a lot of them do still uh, report EPERM um, and uh, in general it would be nicer if we could write second filters where we could specify um, where it could at least uh, filter first level pointers. You cannot do this with the traditional old school BPF language but you could for sure do it with uh, eBPF. The question just becomes uh, uh, whether or not we feel fine with uh, eBPFing uh, SecOM. Yeah, I think on, we yeah. I was going to like on, 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 on our side, as far as what you're looking at, maybe doing um, moving forward there, like as far as other syscalls, we've got some interest in intercepting for, for LXD. We've got, we've had interest on and off for one that's going to scare the head of a lot of people, uh, which is init module and uh, fnit module. So, so that containers can effectively load kernel modules. We would not actually let them load the kernel module. What we would let them do is pass in the kernel module they would like to load. We would pass the kernel module to figure out what the hell it is. And then once you know what it is, compare it to a list of kernel modules where are containers to, to trigger loading and then load the host version of it uh, and not the one that was fed by the container. One of the reasons for that is things like firewalling, uh, where you might need to load uh, some NetFilter plugins and that kind of stuff. And right now, the way we do it is that the container config can list a number of kernel modules that we will load on container startup, but it would be nicer if we could not do that and do it on demand as the container actually needs it. Um, so that's one that's kind of interesting. It will also make for pretty interesting demos, I think. Um, <laughs> but it's a bit scary. And the other thing that I was, what we said we can do with system call interception, but we've not done it yet, is it actually makes it... So SecComp is interesting because it's at the syscall entry point before we've actually gone through the syscall table. So you can actually implement new system calls yeah. on a system entirely in user space because you can totally define a new... like intercept a new syscall number that does not exist in, sys, in SecComp forward it to user space, have a C implementation of what you want the system call to do, prototype, make sure that everything works, user space is going to function and everything. Um, and if that all works, then okay, sure, now you can submit it as actual kernel code. So that's pretty interesting. I've not seen anyone actually do that yet, uh, but that's something we could do. And with that, um, kind of out of time, but questions, and I think it's also break time, so if you do have any, any questions, then um, come see us. There's a question over there we can try and take quickly. Have you written the new syscall kit yet? Maybe you can use uh, get-ins for the interface for that interface pack. I know there's an older approach that was repeating credits that you can send that to the new domain stock kit. So is the new latest just for release that model or is there a reason that you wouldn't work here? Okay, so just to repeat the, repeat the question, it's around the, the new uh, PDFD get-FD interface mm -hmm. uh, and saying that like, in the past we could do that using ptrace and yep. getting the FD and then sending it across and, you know, what's better of this approach. I can think of one, which is you might be run, the task might be running under GDB or strace, at which point you cannot ptrace something that's already being ptraced. So that would actually prevent you from, from doing that. Like a lot of the Cisco interception stuff we're doing with SecComp, you could in theory do with ptrace. It would be slower and it would prevent you from running anything else that uses ptrace. You also don't need to have, for this you probably also would have to have CAPSIS ptrace, right? And in this case, you only need to be able to ptrace the uh, process in question that you want to get DFD from, which is a, a less strict requirement. So you need less, it requires less privileges basically, if I remember this mm -hmm. correctly. I should probably remember the code that I've written, but um, yeah. Okay, I think we should wrap now because we're slightly over time. So thank you very much and feel free to catch us uh, during break. Thank you. Thank you.